I'm Commissioner of Agriculture Steve Troxler and I'm here today to continue in the series of videos that we've been making highlighting the divisions of the department and what they do to touch your life every day. Today I'm going to highlight the Structural Pest Control and Pesticides Division in the Department of Agriculture uh, and it's just what it sounds like. Uh, both of these divisions actually educate and regulate uh, first the structural pest control industry and, and that could be uh, the, the people that you contract with for termite control. Uh, you may want to have your yard sprayed for mosquitoes. Uh, maybe you have an ant problem or, or even a, uh, a pest problem that requires some special measures such as squirrels in the attic or, or critters that you don't want. So we do educate and regulate them but then we also regulate the pesticide industry in North Carolina and uh, also educate them. And this could include, uh, of course, the farmers of North Carolina, but landscapers uh, and pesticide sales dealers. So it's a big job, one that we take uh, very seriously. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have a sleek product section in this division, and I'll explain that one later. The division does have separate uh, responsibilities and sections to deal with this, but they both have the same, uh, basically the same identical task, and that is first to educate before we regulate. And that makes sure that the workers and uh, the people that sell the products, use the products, are properly trained uh, as to how the label indicates that they should be using the product. And last year, in fact, we issued over 42,000 licenses and certifications to people that passed training courses uh, that involved the uh, specialties in their work. And that does include the exterminators, landscapers, and more than 12,500 farmers. Basically, anybody in North Carolina who has been approved to do pest control, use pesticides, uh, They've had to get approval through this division to do this, and then after we do that, of course there is the regulation process that uh, we go through to make sure that everybody is obeying the rules and regulations. Uh, last year, nearly 14,000 pest control and pesticide inspections were conducted by this division. Uh, and we did take over a thousand enforcement samples, so you can see uh, we stay busy doing our job in this division, and they do this job very well. I want to bring in now my uh, division director, uh, Jim Burnett, who has been employed with the Department of Ag for 42 years and has all kinds of experience in this area. In fact, when I combined uh, structural pests and pesticide into one division, Jim was already the uh, division director of pesticides, so he was a natural fit to bring in uh, to this role. So I'm going to bring Jim Burnett in now. Jim, first, I want to thank you for your dedicated service for 42 years to the citizens of North Carolina and the things that you have done uh, to help advance agriculture forward. Uh, I know there is a complicated process that you have to go through, and especially in the regulation of pesticides, uh, including two boards that you deal with, one being the Structural Pest Board and the other being the Pesticide Board. How do you interact with these boards and, and who appoints these boards? Our division administers and enforces two laws in the state, the North Carolina Pesticide Law and the North Carolina Structural Pest Control Law. And there is a policy-making and rule-making and governing authority under each of those laws. With respect to the pesticide law, that's the North Carolina Pesticide Board. It's a seven-member board. Every member is appointed by the governor. The Department of Agriculture has one representative on the board, and my position serves as secretary to that board. Under the Structural Pest Control Law, the governing body is the Structural Pest Control Committee. That's a nine-member group and it is appointed by various authorities. The governor appoints members, the commissioner of agriculture appoints members, the dean of the College of Ag and Life Sciences at North Carolina State appoints a member, the secretary of Health and Human Services appoints a member, the speaker of the House of Representatives and the president pro tem of the Senate each appoint a member to the committee. And I also serve as secretary to that 
committee. So part of our responsibilities in administering and enforcing both of these laws is to investigate any complaint or any allegation revolving around possible pesticide misuse, misapplication, or action by a member of the structural pest control industry. We go out, we conduct our investigations, we pull samples. You said we pulled about 1,100 enforcement samples last year. Once we have completed our investigation, we sit down with the Assistant Attorney General who works with our programs to look at the evidence that we've gathered. The standard that we're required to meet is that there is clear and convincing evidence that a violation has occurred. Once we have satisfied that standard, we are required by state law to attempt to settle these differences. So we'll develop a settlement agreement that will list all of the facts of the case, the violations that we feel we have documented and can substantiate, and our proposed enforcement action. That can be a monetary penalty, that can be a revocation or modification of a license, or the imposition of some sort of remedial training. That is sent back to the individual against who the charges are being levied, and that starts a negotiation. That person can contact us, present additional evidence that we might not have had at first, offer alternative settlement terms, if you will. Once we have reached an agreement under both laws, we present each of those settlements to the appropriate board, the North Carolina Pesticide Board or the North Carolina Structural Pest Control Committee, and each body has to approve any enforcement action in the settlement agreement before it becomes a final action. And I believe all of the uh, fines collected actually go to the school systems of North Carolina after the uh, settlement has been made, is that correct? That's correct. They go to the school system in the county in which the violation took place. Okay. Uh, besides the, the enforcement functions and, and the rulemaking and everything that goes on with pesticides and structural pests, there's some other things that we're involved in that are absolutely, I think, uh, essential for the state of North Carolina. One being the trust fund programs that, uh, that we administer, and I know that comes from a checkoff from everybody that sells pesticides uh, in North Carolina. Uh, and I know one of the functions is the pesticide disposal program that goes back to 1980. What does that do? Commissioner, that's a program that we're so proud of, as, as you rightly stated. In 1980, we were the first state in the nation to offer a completely non-regulatory free service to farmers and homeowners to dispose of supplies of canceled, obsolete, unusable, unwanted, suspended pesticides. We collect them, we contract with a licensed hazardous waste disposal firm, and they are removed from the farmer or homeowner and properly disposed of. Since 1980, we have disposed of over four million pounds of obsolete pesticides, and the demand keeps growing. Just this past disposal collection season, we collected over 208,000 pounds of pesticides in this program. Uh, we also, under the trust fund, we have a plastic pesticide container recycling program that we've operated since 1995. We are number seven in the nation in terms of total quantities of plastic pesticide containers recycled. Since 1995, we've taken care of over 9 million pounds wow. of plastic pesticide containers. This past year, we collected 674,000 pounds of plastic pesticide containers. You know, I get, and I think every farmer gets, that how great a service it is to dispose of uh, unused or outdated pesticides, but I want to emphasize to homeowners that uh, pouring uh, unused pesticides down the drain 
throwing them in a dumpster, throwing them in a trash can uh, is a bad way to dispose of these and it can lead to uh, environmental degradation. So I just ask that homeowners, when they get the opportunity to, to make sure that they dispose of uh, the pesticides in the home uh, properly. Uh, these pesticides in a lot of cases are a lot, uh, not a lot different from what farmers use. So the combination of being able to do this for farmers, uh, pest control operators, and the homeowners, uh, that's a big program and, and a big thanks to you and all of your staff that work so hard uh, to make sure that uh, you do that. Uh, I know we've got a couple more programs that uh, I want to talk about. Field watch or drift watch is one of them and why that's so important, especially, especially when you start talking about uh, honeybees and, and being able to uh, coexist with agricultural operations and, and homeowners for that example. Uh, could you talk about that? Yes, sir. Uh, drift watch is a program that we were able to purchase under the authority of the pesticide board and use money from the Pesticide Environmental Trust Fund a few years ago. And it's a national program that allows growers and pesticide applicators and beekeepers to work together to communicate with each other. It's a free service. Uh, for example, a beekeeper can log on and map the locations of his or her hives. A grower of a specialty crop can go on and map the location of those crops. Then when pesticide applicators are preparing to apply pesticides in an area, they can go on, they can look at the map of the area they're going to be working in, and they can see what sensitive areas are there. Um, it's really been a boon to all of these industries. It increases communications, it increases cooperation, and it reduces adverse effects to the bees, to specialty crops. For example, if I've got a crop that's really sensitive to herbicides, if it's mapped on there, the farmer, for example, can go on and see where that crop is and make whatever adjustments in the pesticide applications need to be made to protect those crops, to protect the bees. Yeah, I'm so proud of that program and the things it's done. And uh, what I know is uh, responsible pesticide applicators and farmers or anybody does not want to intentionally do something that's going to harm specialty crops or honeybees. So this has been a tremendous communication tool, and I think it's had a, a big impact on, on how we do business in North Carolina, especially when you start talking about our specialty crops and the honeybees mm -hmm. that are out there. So I thank you for being an innovator and making sure this happened in North Carolina. We're so proud of that program. Yeah, we are very proud of it. Thank you, Commissioner. The other thing that I wanted to talk about that probably not a lot of people think about is the sleep product section that is in uh, the pesticide section of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And uh, I think the impetus for this being transferred to the department was our experience with pesticides. And if you remember uh, the bed bug, bed bug frenzy that we've been through mm -hmm. several times, uh, so we would be involved in, in bed bugs uh, through this, uh, this, but also so many other things that could happen. Uh, we actually uh, license and inspect uh, sleeping products, uh, and particularly uh, of concern would be secondhand bedding. Uh, and so anything that the public sleeps on, basically, uh, is going to be inspected by our folks, and the people that are selling or manufacturing are going to be licensed by sleep products. And uh, there can be viruses, bacteria, lice, scabies, uh, mites, and, of course, bed bugs that could be involved in this program. Uh, and I had the experience with the secondhand bedding, and I, and I didn't think about it until I went to buy a new mattress and box springs. Uh, I found out that buying a new mattress and box springs is an expensive proposition. Uh, so I went into the store, and they said, uh, this is the price for the new one. And it was expensive, and being a penny pitcher, and my wife too, I said, no, I don't know if I want to invest this much money or not. But they had the same identical bedding that had been sent out one time. Somebody didn't like it and sent it back. 
And under our rules, this bedding had to be sanitized uh, and repackaged for sale. And it was a fraction of the cost of the brand new one. And I got to thinking, I said, you know, I sleep in hotel and motel rooms all over the state, the country, and the world where other people would slept. But there was no sanitation process that had to, they had to go through before I slept on it. So I looked at it, and sure enough, there was our tag on that, uh, that bedding, and I felt comfortable that we had been there, we had done our job, and I could safely buy that product. So I ended up buying the product that had been uh, sanitized, repackaged, and put out for sale. And the only reason I could do it is because I knew about this program and the hard work that the pesticide division in this section put in to making sure everything's done properly. So I thank y'all for that work. Uh, everything you do is so important, not only to agriculture in North Carolina, but uh, the homeowners of North Carolina that depend on uh, people to do the job that they're being uh, hired to do. And our licensing inspection process does ensure that. And in a lot of cases, uh, it's uh, complaint driven. Uh, if if somebody is hired to come out as a structural pest operator to uh, eliminate a pest or uh, do a work, then uh, if it's not done properly, they let us know, we investigate, and the, the proper uh, uh, tactics are taken to make sure that everybody's in compliance. So this has been uh, another update about divisions in the department, and I hope you join me next week for another division in the Department of Agriculture.